On July 8, 1947, the United States Army reported a crashed flying saucer was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico. But the following day, the Army recanted its sensational claim, stating the debris recovered was nothing more than a lost weather balloon. And for the next 30 years, the Army's official weather balloon explanation remained unchallenged. However, in 1978, a retired Air Force Major named Jesse Marcel finally broke silence and revealed the debris he handled at the 1947 Roswell crash was not of this earth. It should be noted that Marcel made no mention of seeing a crashed saucer or aliens. All he described was seeing a field of scattered metal fragments. But Marcel's disclosure seemed to unleash a cascade of testimonies and conjectures that poured forth from the popular media for the following two decades. Tales of alien bodies, exotic technologies, and captured flying saucers have embellished Marcel's original account into what has become our nation's best-known UFO urban legend. And yet, despite years of high-profile media conjecture, what actually crashed in New Mexico in 1947 remains to this day a well-protected secret. However, what is certain is that on September 15, 1947, just two months following the alleged New Mexico saucer crash, President Harry S. Truman signed into law the National Security Act of 1947, which created the National Security Council and America's first peacetime civilian intelligence organization, the CIA. First CIA Director Walter Beetle Smith encouraged UFO reporting as a means of PSYOPs disinformation to protect existing secret aircraft projects. In late July of 1952, a rash of UFOs were reported buzzing our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. That same summer, Smith sent a memorandum to the director of the Psychological Strategy Board outlining the CIA's proposal to the National Security Council stating that the UFO issue presented clear implications for psychological warfare. Smith went on to state, I suggest that we discuss at an early board meeting the possible offensive or defensive utilization of these UFO phenomena for psychological warfare purposes. The National Security Council formed a critical link between the corporate financial world and the government-held secret technologies, a control nexus over rocketry, space, alternative energy research, and even UFOs. It is also important to note that when President Truman originally mandated formation of the CIA in 1947, there was no provision for congressional oversight. By the late 1940s and early 1950s, UFOs were becoming such a broad issue that Air Force General Nathan Twining recommended to President Truman that the UFO issue was bigger than the Manhattan Project and required that it be managed on a larger scale and obviously for a longer period. They would form nothing less than a government within the government, sustaining itself from presidential administration to presidential administration, regardless of whatever political party took power, and ruthlessly guarding their secrets while evaluating every new bit of information on flying saucers they received. As early as 1938, the notorious Orson Welles War of the Worlds radio broadcast had already demonstrated that public disclosure of an alien reality could potentially spark a national panic, assuming what crashed at Roswell was in fact alien. But disclosing evidence of an advanced undefeated Nazi technology was even more explosive, and debris recovered from the Roswell crash also bore suspiciously Nazi origins. It was fully understood by military intelligence that the Third Reich was deeply involved in advanced weapons technology by the end of the war, which included exotic propulsion systems and metallurgy. Not to mention that virtually the entire captured German V-2 rocket program, along with its personnel, had already been transplanted to White Sands, New Mexico, by the United States Army. 
In his book, The Day After Roswell, Colonel Philip Corso revealed military concern that the crashed aircraft debris recovered in the New Mexico desert was also the product of Nazi superweapons science. Conversations with Werner von Braun and Willi Ley at Alamogordo in the days after the crash intimated that there was a deeper story about what the Germans had engineered. The similarity between the Horton flying wing and the craft they had pulled out of the Arroyo was no accident. Dr. Hermann Oberth considered the Roswell craft from the New Mexico desert not a spacecraft but a time machine. Therefore, perhaps the EBs described in the medical autopsy reports were humanoid robots rather than life forms, specifically engineered for long distance travel through space or time. So regardless of whether flying saucers were alien or Nazi or even Russian, the driving defense department imperative was to keep the UFO issue locked under absolute secrecy. This phenomenon, whether terrestrial or extraterrestrial, also demonstrated technologies that totally outclassed all of our nation's existing defense hardware, hence the imperative to initiate an emergency program to match those technologies, much like the top secret Manhattan A-bomb project became a priority. Perhaps then it is perfectly reasonable that presidential administrations going back to the days of Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower have consistently avoided telling the American people the full truth regarding the presence of unidentified craft flying in our skies. Governmental secrecy regarding this issue remains the order of the day. Obviously profound, serious motives still drive this decades-old cover-up. Whether related to the Roswell incident or not, over the many years since 1947, a profound alteration of our national defense establishment has evolved, shifting the reins of government power from the executive branch to a covert, interlocking association between defense contractors, aerospace industries, intelligence agencies, as well as international banking and petroleum cartels. In 1961, President Dwight Eisenhower explicitly defined the growing menace of this military-industrial complex to constitutional authority. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Allegedly, a clandestine treaty and technology exchange with visiting aliens was brokered and managed under the auspices of Majestic 12, a top-secret study group originally assembled by President Harry Truman following the Roswell crash in 1947. And later, President Eisenhower himself was rumored to have secretly met with aliens in 1954. The late Phil Schneider claimed the aliens eventually betrayed this deal. Called the Granada Treaty, this secret agreement allowed the aliens to take a few cows and test their implant techniques on a few human beings, but they had to give details about the people involved. Slowly the aliens altered the bargain until they decided they wouldn't abide by it at all. As well, Colonel Philip Corso, former advisor to President Eisenhower's National Security Council, revealed the treaty was a Trojan horse. These creatures weren't benevolent alien beings who had come to enlighten human beings. They were genetically altered human automatons, cloned biological entities actually who were harvesting biological specimens on Earth for their own experimentation. As long as we were incapable of defending ourselves, we had to allow them to intrude as they wished. According to famed test pilot and CIA operative John Lear, it was President Eisenhower who allowed the reins of power to pass from the hands of the President into the control of the Pentagon. Ever since Eisenhower, the real rulers of the nation have been a military junta. If such a legendary scenario is actual fact, 
for any president to dare disclose such a horror story to the American people would be political suicide. Consequently, the government has endeavored to make UFOs a non-issue by promoting a steadfast campaign of dour ridicule for the last six decades. Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project Blue Book, the Robertson Panel, and the Condon Report all maintain a consistent party-line posture that nothing out of the ordinary exists. Concurrently, an unofficial disclosure campaign promoted through the popular media, all corporate entertainment subsidiaries of the military-industrial complex itself took over the public relations marketing of the UFO issue. Alleged MJ-12 member General Nathan Twining encouraged use of this style of entertainment propaganda in order to create a climate of public attitude that would be able to accept the existence of extraterrestrial life without a general sense of panic. The flying saucer craze of the 1950s has evolved into a vast cultural mythos thanks to a non-stop media blitz that continues to serve up a steady stream of science fiction conditioning to the unsuspecting public. Of course, the best disinformation contains a measure of truth. In a document purported to be the transcript of newly elected President Ronald Reagan's briefing on the subject of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial visitation of planet Earth, CIA Director William Casey and his advisors shared carefully selected fragments of the alien mystery with the President. If authentic, this text reveals how even our nation's chief executives are at the mercy of whatever information the Intelligence Bureau is willing to divulge. A CIA operative called the caretaker explained to President Reagan just how the media was being used to carefully craft a public perception of the UFO phenomenon. Project Dove was a covert operation developed with a dual purpose. The first person who helped us with this disinformation program was Mr. George Adamski back in the early 50s and all productions of UFO related movies. This helps the public to keep their minds open, but also allows us to keep our secret aircraft away from the public's knowledge. The first cooperative venture was the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. That was a cooperative venture with the United States Air Force and the movie industry. We provided the basic subject matter for the movie Close Encounters. Based on such revelations, we must question just how much UFO truth has our government embedded in six decades of Hollywood science fiction films and television programs. Ultimately, out of this frothy entertainment souffle, what one creature has emerged as the single most iconic representation of extraterrestrials? Worldwide, what creature is most instantly recognized as an alien space visitor? The unrivaled star, the unquestioned media darling, to emerge from this marketing blitz has been the Zeta Reticulum Gray. Either by accident or design, the relentless insectoid stare of the Zeta Gray is everywhere, on book covers, coffee mugs, t-shirts, bumper stickers, and keychains. Zeta Gray has been a merchandising phenomena, hawking everything from soda pop to bank cards. 
The Zetas even abduct the kitty cartoon character Gumby. Clearly, the only alien worthy of officially unofficial notice is the Zeta Gray. Public awareness of these greys first came to light in 1966 with the book Interrupted Journey, which was the account of Betty and Barney Hill's abduction in New Hampshire in 1961. With subsequent books such as Bud Hopkins' Intruders, Ray Fowler's The Andreasen Affair, and Whitley Stryber's Communion, more media attention and credibility has been given to the Greys. However, what seemed at least an attempt at official disclosure came on October 14, 1988, in the guise of a two-hour television special entitled UFO Cover-Up Live. Promising to expose the real truth about UFOs, this unprecedented special was aired simultaneously in the United States and the Soviet Union. This program promised an open and unbiased examination of the UFO issue. Yet at the outset, congenial host Mike Farrell, from the popular MASH TV series, summarily dismissed the famous Billy Meyer Pleiadian contact case as a complete hoax without offering viewers the least shred of evidence pro or con to draw their own conclusions. Instead, Farrell proceeded to introduce a disclosure of sorts about the Zeta Reticulum Greys, which obviously was the primary focus of the show. Two informants purported to be government intelligence operatives, introduced as Falcon and Condor, filmed in shadow and with their voices electronically masked, told the Zeta story. Although no live greys consented to be shown on camera, a montage of artist illustrations showed the greys as benign guests of the United States government who had been given a base in Nevada. Falcon and Condor admitted that these creatures came from the Zeta Reticulum star system, but shared no further details as to the nature and purpose of their relationship with our government, save to say the EB, or the extraterrestrial biological entity in custody, was vegetarian with the hankering for strawberry ice cream. How cute. Yet Falcon's deeply disturbing statement that the aliens had complete control over our nation's most highly guarded weapons installation, Area 51, was casually overlooked. The simultaneous broadcast of this program in both the United States and the Soviet Union suspiciously demonstrated high-level government collusion in its production. Clearly, UFO cover-up live was a commercial of sorts to sell the Greys to the American and Soviet people, with an obvious subtext that the Greys had favored nation status with our government's intelligence establishment. Curiously, much of the information shared by Falcon and Condor was consistent with Ronald Reagan's ET briefing from 1981. Despite earning dismal network ratings, this program was a milestone in UFO disclosure. However, whistleblower Robert Lazar, a physicist employed at Area 51, revealed in 1989 additional information that Falcon and Condor failed to mention, suggesting the Greys have had a long-standing proprietary interest in the human species. Lazar reported access to a classified document that revealed these beings said that they had been visiting Earth for a long time and that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man as a species had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we're containers of. These beings conveyed information about the capability of affecting the human brain to anesthetize the human body. This is done without any physical contact from a remote source. If this information is true, Perhaps such a disturbing reality explains the official ambivalence toward disclosure. It's one thing to reveal alien visitors, but quite another to reveal alien harvesters, or worse, to reveal that our government is actively assisting such alien enterprises. Another half-hearted soft-cell disclosure attempt in 1988 involved UFO researcher and former NASA missions analyst Bob Exler, who was approached to serve as consultant on a project called Cosmic Journey. 
This enterprise, developed by Ringling Brothers, was to assemble a traveling exhibit of rocket and space technology, combined with UFO information, including an actual alien body in cryogenic freeze, to be showcased in cities across the United States. But this project was terminated at the time of George Bush Sr.'s election as president. And then again in the mid-90s, a similar project was under consideration by the city of Scottsdale, Arizona. A permanent space technology exhibit was proposed as a public works renovation project. This exhibit was also slated to include an extensive UFO information component as well. Noted researchers such as Bob Dean, Wendell Stevens, and Jim Delatoso were to serve as consultants. My UFO art was to be featured in this project as well. But after several encouraging meetings with city planners, this public information project mysteriously evaporated. In 1995, Disney Corporation produced an astounding UFO documentary that was cautiously aired in only five cities across the country. In the 1950s, Disney had been approached by the Pentagon to produce films debunking UFOs. Forty years later, it seemed the government was using Disney Corporation for a reverse intent, selling the reality of alien life instead. This TV special was gently masked as a promotion introducing the newest George Lucas Tomorrowland thrill ride designed to acclimate the public to their inevitable alien encounter. Of course, Alien Encounter was the name of the ride. Disney CEO Michael Eisner introduced this surprisingly candid documentary outlining the general history of our government's secret involvement with aliens since the famed Roswell crash in 1947. As well, this documentary revealed both the fact of our military's possession of captured aliens and spaceships as well as its motivation for absolute secrecy. What you can't explain, they reasoned, you must deny. For governments determined to maintain their authority, extraterrestrial contact is pure dynamite. But again, this disclosure effort ran out of steam. The Disney UFO documentary was never aired nationally, and the Tomorrowland Alien Encounter ride was eventually replaced with little fanfare. Meanwhile, serious researchers were discovering darker evidence revealing the Gray Agenda. Rampant reports of abductions and cattle mutilations continued. As an abductee herself, the late Dr. Carla Turner speculated, If we are indeed a multi-purpose resource for the aliens, one which they want to continue to use, could they be performing the various reproductive genetic procedures in order to make alterations in their livestock that better serve the uses for which we are harvested. In 1997, the nation was horrified by the Heaven's Gate mass suicide scandal in San Diego, where members of a UFO cult took their own lives allegedly at the bidding of gray extraterrestrials. Thanks to full mass media coverage of this debacle, UFOs for a time became a virtually taboo topic. Were researchers unraveling too much truth behind the E.T. enigma. Clearly the danger remains that rather than simple conditioning to an E.T. reality, public perception can be steered or manipulated to benefit any number of covert agendas. The drift away from the benevolent alien scenarios to hostile invaders themes has become dominant in recent films, and none so explicit as National Geographic's television documentary, When Aliens Attack. Yet how can we hope to engage conventional defense tactics against enemy aliens capable of controlling our minds from a remote source, or who already have complete control over our nation's most sophisticated weapons installation? Is such spin cautionary warning of an impending war with ETs, or could it serve as a useful propaganda tool for a staged false flag alien attack? to justify further need of the military-industrial complex. Vast monolithic defense industry conglomerates require vast monolithic military threats to justify their existence. Nobody ever got rich 
by profiteering from peace. The notorious report from Iron Mountain reminds us the existence of an accepted external menace then is essential to social cohesiveness as well as to the acceptance of political authority. The menace must be believable, it must be of a magnitude consistent with the complexity of the society threatened, and it must appear at least to affect the entire society. Have decades of popular media science fiction disclosure brought the population any closer to the truth regarding UFOs and extraterrestrials? Is the public really being conditioned or just conveniently befuddled? The primary motive for government non-disclosure of an extraterrestrial reality has been defined as protection of the existing political and economic order from collapse due to exposure to a more advanced extraterrestrial civilization. But does this rationale for non-disclosure actually provide a convenient excuse for decades of corporate and political abuse of power and wealth as well? Dr. Stephen Greer states, This cover-up, no matter how well-intentioned initially, got carried away with its own secret power. It abused this power. It has hijacked our future for 50 years. The reasons for secrecy are clear. Global power economic and technological control, geopolitical status quo, the fear of scandal surrounding the exposure of such projects, and their behavior. After World War II, much of our American science was preoccupied with advances in rocket technology for defense purposes and manned space exploration as well. But aside from providing spectacular television news footage, giant rockets were in fact a monstrous waste of energy. The advanced technologies discovered since the Roswell incident, whether German or alien or a combination of both, revealed chemical rockets to be clumsy, inefficient, and totally impractical for interplanetary space exploration. The secret to space travel was understanding and mastery of the unified field, the fundamental fabric of the space-time continuum itself. Ben Rich, the father of the stealth fighter bomber and former head of Lockheed Skunk Works, who was also in charge of operations from 1975 to 1991, confided just before his death in 1995 that the Black Ops Research Group had done just that mastered field propulsion flight systems. He stated, We now have the technology to take ET home. No, it won't take someone's lifetime to do it. We now have the capability to travel to the stars. First you have to understand that we will not get to the stars using chemical propulsion. Rich further confided that linear space travel was impractical, but that all points in space-time are connected. Field propulsion systems can transcend linear time, making interstellar space travel a workable practicality. In the span of time from 1947 to 1995, alien technological realities, at first intellectually shattering, had, according to Rich, become workable scientific practicalities to terrestrial engineers. So here's the disclosure disconnect. To preserve the status quo of national social stability, the black ops community directly involved with quantum technologies has become so far removed from mainstream Americana that it has evolved into a separate high-tech empire unto itself. An elitist hybrid civilization literally disintegrated from its parent civilization as well spin-off technologies that could easily benefit the mainstream population appear to be deliberately withheld. So more than the cultural shock of an extraterrestrial reality, the economic shock of disclosing free energy quantum technologies would likely precipitate a global meltdown of the petroleum dominated geopolitical infrastructure. Researcher and disclosure advocate Richard Dolan states, 
The basic idea of the breakaway civilization is simply that you have a secret group, a classified group of people with access to radically advanced technology, radically advanced science, and they just don't share it with the rest of the world. One scientific breakthrough leads to another, and that leads to another, and so on. So the next thing you know, you have a separate group of humanity that is vastly far beyond the rest of the world. I should think that members of the breakaway civilization might despair of ever educating the rest of humanity on what is going on. Their own reality is probably so far beyond our own, they may rightfully ask, how can they bring us up to speed without causing a worldwide psychological meltdown? Dolan further states, the implications of a UFO reality and cover-up are profound. It means that our society has lived in an official reality so incomplete, so inaccurate, that we may with justice call it fictitious. It means that the history we have learned, the science we think we know, and the very core of who we think we are need to be rediscovered. With this in mind, perhaps the most devastating truth full disclosure would reveal is that antiquated mainstream Americana has become technologically irrelevant. In 2001, Newt Gingrich introduced the Age of Transitions, which showcased the National Science Foundation's workshop agenda to establish on this planet a new species of totally controlled, bioengineered humans. Inevitably, the cybernetic enhancement of human performance is sneaking up on society. Dynamic advances in artificial intelligence technology are swiftly replacing human viability in our culture. In fact, the present exponential growth of bioengineering and computer technologies is about to marginalize the human factor altogether. In 1947, Dr. Hermann Oberth referred to the extraterrestrial biological entities allegedly recovered from the Roswell crash as humanoid robots rather than life forms, specifically engineered for long distance travel through space or time. Today, eugenics science tells us that by the year 2045, the cybernetic post human will have no gender will be non-reproductive, and will be improved in the sense that it will be tailored to specific tasks. Would it not be shocking for UFO disclosure to ultimately reveal that the notorious gray aliens are in fact not aliens visiting from outer space at all, but genetically altered humans visiting from our own future? We'll uh, now hear from Richard Dolan for 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, distinguished members of the committee. And uh, let me just say it's been an honor for me personally to be here with you all week, uh, to be able to, to give statements to you and, and to chat with some of you privately as well. Um, <clears throat> regarding disclosure, I, I have often felt that disclosure on the matter of UFOs and ETs, possible extraterrestrials, is a paradox. It's impossible, but it is inevitable. It's impossible because there is no political motivation for it. It's inevitable, however, because our leaders are not the only factor in this equation. There are other beings, after all. But mainly, I would say, there is us, um, the people, who are going through this greatest uh, social, cultural, and especially technological transformation in the history of humanity. In fact, I would say that we are the game changers. Someday, and it won't be too long in the future, something is going to force someone's hand. It could be a major sighting, it could be a major leak, something. Something that can no longer be denied. After all, we are fast approaching what experts in artificial intelligence call the singularity when computing intelligence exceeds our own. In such a future, I ask you, can we really think we will still be stuck in neutral on this issue? Something will force the president's hand. He or she will finally hold that long-awaited press conference. 
and make that bombshell statement. It might go something like this. I have been advised by the National Security Council and heads of our intelligence community that there is a reality to some of the UFO phenomenon in that some UFOs are real physical craft not manufactured by any known civilization on Earth. Or words to that effect. It's the kind of statement that many proponents of UFO disclosure would like to hear, but the real question is what next? Because there would be quite a few follow-up questions. At the top of the list will be questions about who these other beings are and what their agenda or agendas might be. And this will be a very difficult question for any president to answer. In the first place, there is a likelihood that even the leaders of the black budget or breakaway society that have been on top of this for years, they may not even know, or at least not fully. And what if they do know? And moreover, what if at least some of that answer includes information that might be upsetting? Divining the intentions of non-human visitors or permanent residents, whatever they may be, might not be the easiest thing to do. But it's entirely possible, judging from the data we do have, that some of them may not care very much about humanity. Some may, some may not. What if an agenda has been determined within the intelligence community and this agenda includes something to do with alleged abduction phenomena? And even if that isn't true, does any president honestly believe he or she can contain rampant speculation along these lines? And even if the intentions of these other beings are said to be neutral or positive, there will clearly be tremendous suspicion by large swaths of humanity. This will not be an easy sell. There will already be a sizable number of people predisposed to interpreting these other beings as nothing less than demonic, short of bringing one of these entities to a podium and subjecting it to hours and days and weeks of questions by an insatiable public, it's very likely that any moment of disclosure will not satisfy the public the way it would like to be regarding alien motivations. That's only the beginning of the problems. One early and obvious question that will arise, one which will have deep, profound political implications, will be very simple. How long have you managed to keep this secret all these years? Consider that our entire society has been told that UFOs do not represent anything truly anomalous, that ETs or aliens are definitely not here on Earth interacting with us, that UFO believers may be well-meaning but had been mistaken about all of that. This has been a mindset embedded within all of our major institutions. Our educational institutions from primary school through universities and postdoctoral levels. There are our major news organizations in which an open belief in UFOs is a third rail for one's career. Throughout our scientific establishment for sure and also throughout our political structure. Political careers have been destroyed, or at least severely undermined, by the UFO taint. Remember what happened to Dennis Kucinich in 2008, after it became known that many years before he had seen a UFO. Never mind the fact that the two witnesses he had been with came out and corroborated the sighting. They saw the same thing. All of these institutions and others have treated the UFO topic as nothing more than a joke, something suitable for immature minds. Can it really be that the professors throughout the United States uniformly have dismissed this phenomenon without any cooperation from the intelligence community? Did all the world of science, politics, and media? Well, no. Not when the most modest amount of research shows strong intelligence community influence over all of these institutions. In other words, people will see very clearly that the national security apparatus has created a global culture that has suffocated the truth. Researchers will begin to investigate in a serious way just how these relationships have undermined the credibility of all those institutions and undermined our apprehension of truth. The result will be a major cultural and institutional house cleaning, but it won't stop there. Citizens will naturally want to know specifics about the structure of secrecy itself. That is, they will want to know. If the U.S. president has been out of the loop all these years, as it seems, then who exactly has been in the loop? Who has been running the UFO cover-up? With due respect to Stephen Bassett, that's the phrase that I do use. 
If the answer is anything along the lines of my own research so far, it will show that the cover-up has long ago gravitated away from formal presidential authority into international and private hands. It's not that the U.S. president is a non-player in all of this, but rather is more like the public face of the true power elite that stands behind. We all, I think, have come to understand this when it comes to power in general, and this will likely be the case when we begin a sophisticated analysis of UFO secrecy. In other words, the moment of disclosure will trigger an intellectual revolution worldwide relating to the true structure of power on planet Earth. It will be a moment in which the world sees and acknowledges that the emperor has been wearing nothing at all. The political fallout will be tremendous and a great battle will develop within the first year of disclosure. Think of it this way, just because the president has been forced into making an announcement doesn't mean that the CIA and all the other intelligence groups that have been managing this will simply walk away. There has been a concerted effort spanning an entire human lifetime to control this topic. A great deal has been invested and mere disclosure is not going to change that. The real issue in the immediate post-disclosure world will be who controls the spin on the story. Because right away there will be a great divide, a chasm. Once this topic is available for open discussion, you can be sure that people around the world will be demanding answers. You can be just as sure that on the other side of the fence, information will be handed out as sparingly as possible. Government spin doctors will be out in great numbers trying to control the situation according to national security policy, although this time independent UFO searchers may get a public hearing that they hadn't gotten before. If the official spokespersons are making misleading or false statements, it's going to be a bit easier post-disclosure for independent researchers to point this out, because this time the world will be much more likely to listen. And there will be many, many more investigators into this topic after disclosure than there are today. How all that will turn out, only time will tell. There are so many other messy issues relating to global finance, energy, truth commissions, lawsuits, cultural transformations, cultural wars, religious and spiritual changes, scientific paradigm shifts, and ultimately geopolitical changes that will allow us to meet the challenge of, shall we call them others, here on planet Earth in some sort of coordinated, hopefully logical manner, and even more hopefully in some way that answers to the people rather than a handful of elite human players. And for that, we will need a groundswell of public pressure from below and tremendous political energy, ethics, and courage to take on the black budget culture that has dominated this subject for so long and to begin a long, hard fight to reclaim some measure of freedom and dignity for humanity while we begin a new, better, and more mature phase of our existence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gawa. <laughs>
It's going to be the greatest movie in regards to the UFO phenomenon. You're going to hear things and see things you've never seen. Through the information that we've received over the past four years right here at Third Phase of Moon, thousands of interviews, thousands of people submitting their stories, hundreds, almost up to a thousand exclusive videos from around the world. People are telling us what's going on in dark government. In this movie, you will see and hear things you've never heard of. It's going to be an exclusive, and you're here for the ride. Third Phase of Moon, these are the new stills you're looking at. Chime in below in the comments of what you think this movie's going to be about and what you think of these videos, these stills right now that we're sharing on Third Phase of Moon. It's going to be an exclusive. We're excited that we're working on this film. We feel right here at Third Phase of Moon with the knowledge that we know it's about time. We share and do something about this and make a movie that will wake up the world. We're bringing in reverse alien technology, possibly taken from the area, uh, the Roswell crash in 1947, later taken over to uh, Area 51. And right now we're sharing these, again, exclusive pictures only right here on Third Phase of Moon. And I wanted to invite one of the actors that's playing a war correspondent. Actually, he's... His character, he's been to Afghanistan, he's been to Iraq. Now that the wars are over, journalism has kind of, that war correspondent, there's not much going on. So he's looking for more work, and he's set on assignment to follow rumor about a, rec a machine recovered from 1947, and somebody wants to share it with the media. I wanted to invite Orlando Smith live on Third Phase of Moon Radio. Hey, man, it's been really good working with you, Orlando. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, set with you guys. You know, it's a really interesting topic that we're discussing, and it, it just so happens that it's like one of my hobbies to follow some of these things. A lot of my credible colleagues um, in the information business, which I this is what I do. I'm not actually an actor. I'm just a special guest starring on this thing as a little bit of a fun side. But... You know, there are a lot of accounts out there that are credible that I've heard, and this is why I'm, I've, I've just become fascinated over the years. And that's why this movie is going to address a lot of topics that are becoming more and more mainstream out there, things that I didn't used to accept myself. But recently uh, there have been accounts that have really changed my perspective on what our bloodlines have been mixed with, who we really are as a human species, our history as it relates to other galactic species out there. And these kinds of questions are, are really prevalent right now, and that's why this movie is really a fascinating project to be working on. Wow, thanks, uh, Orlando. You know, we've been on set for the past, what, three weeks now, working pretty much every day right now. That's why we've been so busy right here at Third Phase, and you haven't seen much UFOs coming out. We have a lot of UFOs on file. People have been submitting them over the past three weeks. We're going to be getting to those. In shortly, but we've been working really hard on this uh, movie. We want to get it out to the world, shock the world, share it to everybody, and people might wake up. Orlando, I wanted to ask you about some of these scenes right on location. We uh, have a PBE, an extraterrestrial biological entity, a, a movie prop sent in by uh, the Zetan.net uh, Corp over there. They they supplied Third Phase of Moon with an incredible alien, but and we've been bringing this thing uh, to life. Tell me, Orlando, the visuals that you're seeing on this movie and the location, what do you think? Well, the sets are incredible locations. It's it's really incredible how we've gotten to work on these military bunkers. You know, these a lot of these bunkers have been unused for maybe forty or fifty years. But they're they're monstrosities that remind me of World War Two era Russian construction or something. These massive bunkers, underground uh, facilities, power generation facilities, water um, production facilities, and it's really incredible. The sets are just right out of World War II Russia, it seems like, or something like out of the Ukraine. Well, exactly right, Orlando. We, uh, we're tentatively calling the movie Hangar 52, based on the new Area 52 secret base that apparently might be existing at this moment. Area 51's old news now that the government has come out publicly saying that it exists. The alien uh, government cover-up, the possible collaboration with draconians and uh, the government. We're getting into it. It's going to be a cross between Close Encounters and uh, Raiders Lost Ark. It's uh, quite incredible. Actually, my neck kind of hurts right now because we just got done doing this major action sequence where I'm getting my butt kicked by a draconian in disguise as an MIB, Men in Black. 
Let's go to area code 706. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show. I know you have uh, experiences with abductions and the evil side of aliens. I wanted to get your opinion on people say that not all aliens are evil. You know, you got the draconians and then you have the alien greys, which are basically more uh, of a more of an entity to help mankind more than to destroy it. What's your opinion? Well, what I'm thinking about the aliens and the Coronians is the, um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the abduction differences. Um, with the Greys, like, they soothe you before they abduct you. With the um, Arconians, they just take you and just experiment you roughly and just leave scars all over you. Yeah, you know, exactly right. They're the, the, the scars are prevalent uh, right after an abduction. And uh, if you have an abduction experience and you've, seen some mysterious scars on your body, you might want to get yourself x-rayed to see if you have alien implants. It's most likely you have one in your body if you've uh, had an abduction experience and you have these mysterious scars on there. I suggest if you have this experience, go go get a regular checkup and an x-ray. You might find something. And then uh, contact Third Phase Moon if anything comes up, an anom- anomaly of some uh, sort. Our new movie coming out. These are stills. Wait till the trailer. You haven't seen anything yet. We're going to be releasing the exclusive trailer exclusively right here at Third Phase Moon. But these photos that we're sharing are, we just wanted to get this out to the world, showing what Third Phase Moon's working on. Brent Cousins is here. He's been, uh, he just got in off the set. We just did this major fight sw- sequence between uh, myself and a draconian. Brent, tell me how's shoot- shooting going and uh, what's your experience so far? Man, it's been a super shoot today. What an ass kicker. Blake got his butt kicked. He is flying over tables, getting attacked by a draconian absolutely getting pummeled we can't wait to see it and we can't wait to show it to you guys and we just actually had a couple other actors just just popped in one of our main uh actors his name goes by jordan and he plays a war correspondent that just got out of the okay cool did uh orlando get anything to say yeah he did did he tell us about your character orlando go ahead tell me character. well you know i'm a former afghanistan war correspondent who's kind of burnt out and perhaps even uh, chemically um, having some health and mental issues, just recovering from so much heavy action corresponding with uh, the different Middle Eastern conflicts. And so I'm out there uh, just looking for work, and I come across an opportunity to uh, hunt down some information that is turns out to be extremely sensitive, and there are multiple agencies and other interests, even intergalactic interests, that are all chiming in on this, and it's coming to a head, and it seems like humankind is, uh, in reality and in this movie, really on the brink of transition right now. And so this movie is addressing a lot of issues that we're really seeing in real life right now, things that are hot topics in people's minds, and we want to get the conversation going. So, um, you know, between these epic military sets and this awesome cast, and the Cousins Brothers production facilities and so forth. You know, it's an awesome project, so I'm looking forward to see how it comes out. Yeah, absolutely, Orlando. Uh, Brent, I wanted to ask you about, you know, the information that we've gotten from the public in regards to the way we're shooting this movie. We're not just making this stuff up. This is basically we've been doing our research for four years doing this movie, and it's coming across something, like I said, nobody hasn't seen anything like this before. Brent? Yeah, basically, when we first started Third Phase of Moon, we're pretty, uh, we, weren't, we weren't experts in the UFO field, uf- ufology. But over the years, over the past five years, we've really grown with people from around the world are basically writing this story. They're the ones that are coming up. It's not even a story. We're just basically telling the truth, and we're kind of creating a cinematic format behind it. But what the actual things that you're going to be seeing in this movie are actual facts from the people around the world, people that are submitting videos, we're basically taking a script from the public, and that's what we like best. That's right. Uh, You know, what we're doing in this movie, I think, is something different from regular Hollywood. They're going to touch on certain topics, but they're going to shy away from the controversial issues, and we're going to be hitting those head on. And we really can't wait to uh, share this movie with the world. Again, We're not like Hollywood. You're not going to have to wait for a year or two years before this movie is coming out. We're already into it probably about – we're just about hitting the halfway mark. We've been working on it for about three weeks, four weeks now. We're pushing this. We're working hard. 
And, uh, you know, it's looking good. Uh, you can tell by these photos. When we share it on uh, YouTube, Third Phase of Moon, we'll be posting these exclusive photos. Share this. Get the word out. Right now we're calling it Hangar 52. Is there another area known as Area 52 going on, working with reverse-engineered uh, technology from the Ellen Roswell crash? Well, that's what uh, we think, and I think the world changed when that happened. So, you know, something's going on. We're going to share this stuff. And, uh, you know, enjoy these pictures right now. I'm going to play some music, and we'll be right back. All right, guys, if you're lucky enough to be listening to Third Phase of Moon, we're going to be uploading to the chat room right now to share to the world for the first time. We're having a little difficulty with that, but stand by. We're here with Orlando Smith, the lead actor in Area 50, Hangar 52, excuse me. And he's got a little experience about, what were you talking about earlier with me? About the 42? Well, the K-14, um, the logical extension of the Majestic 12, MJ-12, has become a common term almost, you know, among uh, UFO aficionados and conspiracy theorists. But um, now entering the conversation recently, at least in my sphere, has been discussion of the K-14, which is another similar Black ops, you know, un- hard to track the funding, hard to track the activities, but the way uh, information always tends to leak out because of the ethical boundaries that tend to be crossed, uh, s- some people within these organizations end up speaking, and it trickles out, and over time um, it becomes part of the conversation. And so, you know, this K-14 business really relates to what we're discussing in the movie as far as suppressing information from the public, which is what really is generating a lot of the interest on this channel. You know, everybody knows here um, that there's much suppressed information, and so we're all trying to find out what's really going on. And we, we, we're really interested in elevating this discussion to a place where the information circulation is truly going to lead us to the truth. And so... K-14, everybody. Woody, what's your thoughts on K-14? Well, it's the first time I've heard of that, Orlando, uh, the K-14. I've heard of Majestic 12, uh, the people above uh, national security. They're, they uh, have no you know, jurisdiction. They're, they're ahead of everybody. They could get away with whatever they want to because they're the ones in charge of the alien phenomenon. K-14, I have not heard of it, but I wanted to ask you about the Rothschilds and the, their power. People have said that in Malaysia... Flight 370, there was some uh, involvement by the Rothschilds. Tell us about the, the, you know, their power, these guys in power. What are they going to do? Are they going to help mankind, or are they pretty much in it for themselves? It's apparent that uh, their, their main goal is complete domination, and by the concentration of wealth, and then the same with the power structure, these elite organizations really don't have a benevolent long-term goal. What they really want is, is is something that would really freak most of us out if we were to get access to the planning um, steps that are already underway and the things that are planned for the future, such as population reduction and a whole reorganization of the economic structure and really the way we live, the way we think, the way we digest and receive information. So, you know, this is, this is really uh, an elitist um, – agenda that doesn't serve the interests of the people and that's why people are so excited and so uh, that's why these topics are so controversial because they're tapping into something that is absolutely sensitive and it re- it really will determine the future of our lives all of us here on the planet absolutely you know Orlando that's what we've been working hard on is this whole movie will be relevant to the big cover-ups the big powers that may be to suppress the information, free technology, free energy for the world. Let's change this place. Let's make the planet live again. Let's let's end all wars. Free energy is about to happen. We're going to be flying in anti-gravity machines. You're going to see all this stuff in our in the movie Hangar 52 coming out in third phase. Everybody's watching. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us right here on this radio show. But I got to get back to the editing board. So we could start working on more clips of myself getting beat up. Everybody's going to love it by a draconian. I'm not going to win this fight, people. But we're going to win the fight on getting the information out to the world. So it's up to you. Disclosure's in your hands, people. 
And if you capture anything amazing in regards to the UFO phenomenon, hey, we want to share it right here at Third Phase of Moon via Skype, Facebook, Twitter. Hey, check us out. Because who are you going to show this stuff to? MUFON? No, they're dropping the ball. I don't know where. I think it's Third Phase. We're on it. We're going to be here. Everybody keep your eyes on the skies. My name's Blake Cousins. We'll see you again next time. That's right. Uh, you know, what we're doing in this movie, I think, is something different from regular Hollywood. They're, they're going to touch on certain topics, but they're, they're going to shy away from the controversial issues, and we're going to be hitting those head on. And we really can't wait to uh, share this movie with the world. Again, we're not like Hollywood. You're not going to have to wait for a year or two years before this movie is coming out. We're already into it probably about – we're just about hitting the halfway mark. We've been working on it for about – Three weeks, four weeks now, we're pushing this, we're working hard, and, uh, you know, it's looking good. Uh, you can tell by these photos. When we share it on uh, YouTube, Third Phase of Moon, we'll be posting these exclusive photos. Share this. Get the word out. Right now, we're calling it Hangar 52. Is there another area known as Area 52 going on, working with reverse-engineered uh, technology from the Ellen Roswell crash? Well, that's what uh, we think, and I think the world changed when that happened, so... You know, something's going on. We're going to share this stuff. And, uh, you know, enjoy these pictures right now. I'm going to play some music, and we'll be right back. All right, guys, if you're lucky enough to be listening to Third Phase of Moon, we're going to be uploading to the chat room right now to share it to the world for the first time. We're having a little difficulty with that, but stand by. We're here with Orlando Smith. The lead actor in Area 50, Hangar 50, Net uh, Corp over there. They they supplied Third Phase of Moon with an incredible alien, but and we've been bringing this thing uh, to life. Tell me, Orlando, the visuals that you're seeing on this movie and the location. What do you think? Well, the sets are incredible locations. It's it's really incredible how we've gotten to work on these military bunkers. You know, these a lot of these bunkers have been unused for maybe 40 or 50 years, but they're, they're monstrosities that remind me of World War II era Russian construction or something. These massive bunkers, underground uh, facilities, power generation facilities, water um, production facilities, and it's really incredible. The sets are just right out of World War II Russia, it seems like, or something like out of the Ukraine. Well, exactly right, Orlando. We, uh, we're tentatively calling the movie... Hangar 52, based on the new Area 52 secret base that apparently might be existing at this moment. Area 51's old news now that the government has come out publicly saying that it exists. The Ellen uh, government cover-up, the possible collaboration with Draconians and uh, the government. We're getting into it. It's going to be a cross between Close Encounters and uh, Raiders Lost Ark. It's uh, quite incredible. Actually, my neck kind of hurts right now because we just got – done doing this major action sequence where I'm getting my butt kicked by a draconian in disguise as a MIB, men in black. Well, agencies and other interests, even intergalactic interests that are all chiming in on this, and it's coming to a head, and it seems like humankind is, uh, in reality and in this movie, really on the brink of transition right now. And so... This movie is addressing a lot of issues that we're really seeing in real life right now, things that are hot topics in people's minds, and we want to get the conversation going. So, um, you know, between these epic military sets and this awesome cast and the Cousins Brothers production facilities and so forth, you know, it's an awesome project. So I'm looking forward to see how it comes out. Yeah, absolutely, Orlando. Uh, Brent, I wanted to ask you about, you know, the information that we've gotten from the public in regards to the way we're shooting this movie. We're not just making this stuff up. This is basically we've been doing our research for four years doing this movie, and it's coming across something, like I said, nobody hasn't seen anything like this before. Brett? Yeah, basically when we first started Third Phase of Moon, we're pretty, uh, we, weren't, we weren't experts in the UFO field, uf- ufology, 
but over the years, over the past five years, we've really grown with people from around the world are basically writing this story. They're the ones that are coming up. It's not even a story. We're just basically telling the truth, and we're kind of creating a cinematic format behind it. But what the actual things that you're going to be seeing in this movie are good or are they evil? It's a government trying to cover up the alien agenda. Right now, you're looking at exclusive photos from the new movie that we're working on. It's going to be premiering soon, in the next six months. Stand by. It's going to be the greatest movie in regards to the UFO phenomenon. You're going to hear things and see things you've never seen. Through the information that we've received over the past four years right here at Third Phase of Moon, thousands of interviews, thousands of people submitting their stories, hundreds, almost up to a thousand exclusive videos from around the world. People are telling us what's going on in dark government. In this movie, you will see and hear things you've never heard of. It's going to be an exclusive, and you're here for the ride. Third phase of moon, these are the new stills you're looking at. Chime in below in the comments of what you think this movie's going to be about and what you think of these videos, these stills right now that we're sharing on third phase of moon. It's going to be an exclusive. We're excited that we're working on this film. We feel right here at third phase of moon with the knowledge that we know it's about time. We share and do something about this and make a movie that will wake up the world. We're bringing in reverse alien technology, possibly taken from the area, uh, the Roswell crash in 1947, later taken over to uh, Area 51. And right now we're sharing these, again, exclusive pictures only right here on Third Phase of Moon. And I wanted to invite one of the actors that's playing a war. Absolutely sensitive, and it, re it really will determine the future of our lives, all of us here on the planet. Absolutely. You know, Orlando, that's what we've been working hard on is this whole movie will be relevant to the big cover-ups, the big powers that may be to suppress the information, free technology, free energy for the world. Let's change this place. Let's make the planet live again. Let's, let's end all wars. Free energy is about to happen we're going to be flying in anti-gravity machines. You're going to see all this stuff in, our, in the movie, Hangar 52, coming out in third phase. Everybody's watching. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us right here on this radio show, but i got to get back to the editing board so we can start working on more clips of myself getting beat up. Everybody's going to love it by a draconian. I'm not going to win this fight, people, but we're going to win the fight on getting the information out to the world. So it's up to you. Disclosure's in your hands, people. And if you capture anything amazing in regards to the UFO phenomenon, hey, we want to share it right here at Third Phase of Moon via Skype, Facebook, Twitter. Hey, check us out. Because who are you going to show this stuff to? MUFON? No, they're dropping the ball. I don't know where. I think it's Third Phase. We're on it. We're going to be here. Everybody keep your eyes on the skies. My name's Blake Cousins. We'll see you again next time. They supplied Third Phase of Moon with an incredible alien, but and we've been bringing this thing uh, to life. Tell me, Orlando, the visuals that you're seeing on this movie and the location, what do you think? Well, the sets are incredible locations. It's, it's really incredible how we've gotten to work on these military bunkers. You know, these, a lot of these bunkers have been unused for maybe 40 or 50 years, but they're, they're monstrosities that remind me of, World War II era Russian construction or something. These massive bunkers, underground uh, facilities, power generation facilities, water um, production facilities, and it's really incredible. The sets are just right out of World War II Russia, it seems like, or something like out of the Ukraine. Well, exactly right, Orlando. We, uh, we're tentatively calling the movie... Hangar 52, based on the new Area 52 secret base that apparently might be existing at this moment. Area 51's old news now that the government has come out publicly saying that it exists. The alien uh, government cover-up, the possible collaboration with Draconians and uh, the government. We're getting into it. It's going to be a cross between Close Encounters and uh, Raiders Lost Ark. It's uh, quite incredible. Actually, my neck kind of hurts right now because we just got – done doing this major action sequence where I'm getting my butt kicked by a draconian in disguise as a MIB men in black. Let's go to area code 706. <laughs>
seen some mysterious scars on your body, you might want to get yourself x-rayed to see if you have alien implants. It's most likely you have one in your body if you've uh, had an abduction experience and you have these mysterious scars on there. I suggest if you have this experience, go go get a regular checkup and an x-ray. You might find something. And then uh, contact Third Phase Moon if anything comes up, an anomaly of some uh, sort. Our new movie coming out. These are stills. Wait till the trailer. You haven't seen anything yet. We're going to be releasing the exclusive trailer exclusively right here at Third Phase Moon. But these photos that we're sharing, are we just wanted to get this out to the world, showing what Third Phase Moon is working on. Brent Cousins is here. He's been, uh, he just got in off the set. We just did this major fight sw- sequence between uh, myself and a draconian. Brent, tell me how's shoot- shooting going and uh, what's your experience so far? Man, it's been a super shoot today. What an ass kicker. Blake got his butt kicked. He is flying over tables, getting attacked by a draconian, absolutely getting pummeled. We can't wait to see it, and we can't wait to show it to you guys. And we just actually had a couple other actors just just popped in. One of our main uh, actors, his name goes by Jordan, and he plays a war correspondent that just got out of the... Okay, cool. Did uh, Orlando get anything to say? Yeah, he did. Did he he tell us about your character, Orlando? Go ahead, tell him your character. Well, you know, I'm a former Afghanistan war correspondent who's kind of burnt out and perhaps even uh, chemically uh, working on. It's going to be premiering soon, in the next six months. Stand by. It's going to be the greatest movie in regards to the UFO phenomenon. You're going to hear things and see things you've never seen. Through the information that we've received over the past four years right here at Third Phase of Moon, thousands of interviews, thousands of people submitting their stories, Hundreds, almost up to a thousand exclusive videos from around the world. People are telling us what's going on in dark government. In this movie, you will see and hear things you've never heard of. It's going to be an exclusive, and you're here for the ride. Third phase of moon, these are the new stills you're looking at. Chime in below in the comments of what you think this movie's going to be about and what you think of these videos, these stills right now that we're sharing on third phase of moon. It's going to be an exclusive We're excited that we're working on this film. We feel right here at Third Phase of the Moon with the knowledge that we know. It's about time we share and do something about this and make a movie that will wake up the world. We're bringing in reverse alien technology, possibly taken from the area, uh, the Roswell crash in 1947, later taken over to uh, Area 51. And right now we're sharing these, again, exclusive pictures only right here on Third Phase of the Moon. And I wanted to invite... One of the actors that's playing a war correspondent, actually, he's, his character, he's been to Afghanistan, he's been to Iraq. Now that the wars are over, journalism has kind of, that war correspondent. So there's no need, if you can travel from one star system in one point in space-time to another by going beyond the speed of light through these other dimensions, there's no reason that there'd be that kind of an event that would be for their own self-interest, number one. Number two... The, the, what you ask about this false flag event, what people haven't understood about what I'm talking about is that that event has been going on for 50 years. In other words, since Eisenhower lost control of these covert projects in the 50s, they have been putting out disinformation that has been tailored to create within the Hollywood, science fiction, and UFO subcultures this sort of aura of fear and of alien evasion and fearing all things alien. And I think this is uh, something that people don't understand. It's a long-term project. What Werner von Braun, when he was talking about this, uh, he was talking about it you know, in 1974. That was 40 years ago. So it isn't like this is something that's just like a singular event that's going to happen. It's an ongoing disinformation and counterintelligence project that all of us have been victims of. Are they going to get it on a two. world scale, though, like CNN all at once? Is that on the table? or they, that, that, Sure. That's they're not... something that, that I would say that's something that's possible in the future, uh, and I think people would have to be very, very careful about how they evaluate what's going on. I mean, you know, I wish we had been so ca- careful about the claims about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before we went up and, and, da- and completely dissembled that country and look what we have now probably what's going to become the biggest uh, terrorist and radical state in the entire world much worse in Afghanistan so I think that what people have to begin to do is they need to question this and if it's on CNN or any other major network you really need to question it I hate to say it because you know those guys 
uh, are often just basically uh, taking dictation from the right hand of the king. And I'm quoting, you know, that what I just said, taking dictation from the right hand of the king is a lot. A very good friend of Mike Wallace who at 60 Minutes told me up in New York back in the 90s, a guy named Schwartz. And uh, Schwartz, this guy told me, he said, look, he says, I used to think we had a free press. He says, you know, and he, he had been dealing with Mike Wallace on some of this stuff, dealing with these majestic documents and other things way back in the 80s and 90s. He says, what I found is that basically the big media cannot cover and will only portray things that they are ordered to do because they're corporatized. And those big media corporations are vertically and horizontally integrated into the system. So, you know, I think that uh, something certainly could be done like that. Now, the other issue is that you can have an authentic ET event, and it could be spun into something that is an invasion. For example, I'll give you a great example. Um, back during the darkest days of the Cold War, as you know from the Disclosure Project witnesses, that many of our intercontinental ballistic missile, our nuclear missile silos, and facilities were overflown by ET craft. A number of cases where, like in Minot, North Dakota, uh, where you had 16 to 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, thermonuclear weapons, that were rendered unlaunchable all at the same time. Now, at the same time that, the same era when that was happening, Sam, I remember talking to Sam Donaldson of ABC News about this, that, that was going on in the Soviet Union with their nuclear weapons, but in a different way. And basically, what one of the, a captain who was there in the Air Force at Minot, North Dakota, said he really felt that the ETs were saying, don't blow up this beautiful planet. But if you do launch, know this, we can intervene so you don't destroy all life on Earth because this Earth is precious. He really got that vibe. And I said, well, of course, that's what they were saying. If they wanted to come in and just invade and sanitize the whole Earth of all this stuff, they could do that probably in a couple of nanoseconds. The problem is that would look like an invasion. So it's sort of a catch-22. They're waiting for us to fix this problem because if it's done from outside, number one, we're not going to learn any lessons and evolve. And number two, it will be portrayed by these special interests as an invasion when it isn't, when they're simply trying to help or prevent something disastrous. So I think we have to look at this in a much wiser way than the sort of the, I don't know, the paranoiac and sensationalism uh, that, that permeates this issue right now. And, and that's one of the more difficult things for people to accept because to be thoughtful about this is, is really difficult and to be reactionary is predictable, but cliché. Dr. Greer, we got a break in a couple minutes, but uh, real quick, I wanted to give Blake any last words before he goes. Well, certainly, we're going to be uh, getting on location and working on our latest uh, production. It's a feature-length film. Everybody uh, take, uh, keep an eye out for it, Hangar 52. And, yeah, Dr. Greer, I, I think you're going to dig what you, you, you're going to see in this film. Maybe you don't quite know the angle we're going to go at it. But definitely, it's a, it's not a horror movie, but it is a thrill ride, and it's inspirational for humanity. Uh, do you think there's good people in in power that you know they're looking out for the human race, and that's why uh, everything's still you know still together? Everything's not falling apart yet. Are they still in control? Well, control is a very big word. I would say there are certainly good people in all walks of life um, who want us to make it through this challenge, and. Uh, you know, a few months ago, I was on an island out off the coast of Australia with 120 uh, leaders from around the world. And, you know, there were at least 10 or 20 percent of those people who were very enlightened, very concerned about the public. The organizers of this event, uh, which is sort of a more elite thing like Davos or the World Economic Forum, um, are enormously supportive of what we're trying to do with the CE5 initiative and disclosure and bringing out these technologies for peaceful use. So, And these were some of the most powerful and connected people in the world. Now, with that said, there were probably half the people who were there who I thought were going to hurl me into the Coral Sea in the Great Barrier Reef and drown me before I got off that island. Um, the, 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 the hate stares were ended, you know, oh, my God. I mean, it was painful, actually. But... Um, but, you know, I'm used to that. I mean, you know, it's, I'm used to being...
and the person people love to hate. But I Dr. think that uh, we're going to go to break. Everybody, stand by. We have Dr. Greer, the man himself. Stay tuned. Third Phase Moon. We'll be right back. Exciting interview so far with uh, the world famous Dr. Greer, uh, and we're going to be asking him about the Atacama alien. Because go, go ahead, John. I was going to say, we're going to bring them right back. You let me know when we're bringing them right back. But it, we need to announce the winner of the oh, okay. contest. Uh, the winner, wow. yes. Uh, did you want to do the honors of what I sent you? Uh, you go ahead, Dr. J. The winner of this week's ticket. Remember, all tickets valued are $5,000. We are giving them here exclusively through Third Phase of Moon and on Revolution Radio. And the winner this week is Stephen Einpar. Again, Stephen Einpar, if you are out there listening, uh, call in or you watch for an email from Blake Cousins or, and, of course, the contact in the desert people. If you want to be next week's winner or and, and every winner we have every Thursday this month, go to contactinthedesert.com slash third phase of the moon exclusive contest. Blake, Congratulations, you. Stephen, and uh, if you're out there at Contact in the Desert, Joshua Tree, the event, Dr. Greer will be there. They'll be uh, doing the CS5, communicating with the extraterrestrials, and if you capture anything amazing, send it to Third Phase of the Moon via Skype or Facebook. We'd love to share it to the world, and we're working on this exclusive movie, Hangar 52, in regards to the UFO abduction phenomenon, world government conspiracies about covering up technology. That could save the world, make uh, energy free all around the world. Things could change. But we also wanted to get Dr. Greer on. Ring him up, Dr. J, because this, we wanted to ask him some incredible questions about the Atacama alien. And it's going to be incredible hour or two coming up because Absolutely. only right here at Third Phase I'm, Moon. I'm going to give him the chance right. to uh, finish about the cabal. Uh, Dr. Greer, welcome back. We are live on Revolution Radio. And right before we went to break, you were cut off. Yeah, sorry, when the music comes on, the uh, show is on break and out uh, over. No but problem. you were talking about uh, you know, the, the cabal. And I wanted to ask you, the, you know, finishing with what you were saying, what can we do to dethrone these, uh, these people that are controlling us? And as you were explaining, uh, the, the false people that are creating the false flags. Well, I think that we have to just create another reality. In other words, if you take on a center of power like that, you're giving in and giving them more power. So what you, if you do it directly, what you do is, while not totally ignoring them, you go forward with a positive initiative uh, and do it notwithstanding their existence. And this is a sort of a strategic Aikido uh, that really will work. And, of course, that if you look at the history of uh, Gandhi or Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, many things, that's basically what they did. Uh, you know, they did not go and attack, you know, directly in some sort of confrontational conflict, uh, the British in India. But they came together as a people and asserted that they wanted to have uh, this through a nonviolent and peaceful Effort. Same thing with Martin Luther King, and of course I grew up in, in the South during that era and was involved with those events. And I think that, you know, we have to learn that the way to make this happen is to come together as a people, know that there is this threat out there, and be, have our eyes wide open, but then go ahead and create our own community of peace, our community of contact, attempt to come together and bring these technologies out even though there are great forces that would like us not to, and start anew our civilization. It isn't going to happen, I think. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, in my case, if I get invited to a meeting with a lot of people, some of whom are really, quite frankly, sociopathic uh, leaders or people, and my view of it is that I view every person as someone who is educable. I go there without prejudice. And I've been surprised, you know, I mean, there have been some people that I would have assumed would have been dead set against everything that we're advocating who are actually very supportive. Uh, and then vice versa, people that would appear to be uh, very progressive and open-minded who are actually uh, fronting for a cabal, and they just put that on as a, as a mask. So, you, you know, you really kind of have to take each individual as, as they really are. 
But I think that the real way to do it is to do what we're doing through the global CE5 initiative, disclosure, where, I mean, you know, when we first launched the disclosure project and, and the worldwide disclosure movement uh, 13 years ago, it, what was interesting about that is that almost uh, over 800 million people around the world heard about it. It was on every network in the world. Now, the big corporate titans that are tied to the intelligence community took it down, but people learned. And now if you go all over the world, the majority of people around the world believe we're not alone in the universe and are being visited. Uh, in fact, the last year a poll came out, 43% of Americans uh, think that we are currently being visited, but a majority of Americans think we have been visited by intelligent life. So, you know, in a sense, we've, that, we, we've, we've accomplished that. The, the question becomes, how do you organize into some constructive effort? And that's where this whole concept of what, what, what we call citizen's diplomacy, where each individual says, okay, I can become, as it were, an ambassador from planet Earth to these civilizations with an understanding of what we might have in common. And the biggest thing we have in common is that they're conscious and sentient, and so are we. So what is the nature of mind? What is the nature of consciousness? How can that be experienced in a way that becomes increasingly universal and result in not only an operating system, such as our remote viewing and vectoring system, but also an understanding that no matter how different someone might look from us, um, or how different their evolutionary track may have been, that at the core, the light of the spirit, the light of consciousness that is within that being is the same conscious mind that's within us. That point of, you know, sort of ineffable unity and oneness is the foundation for an entirely new uh, civilization on this planet that can become worthy of being an interplanetary civilization. So that's what we need to manifest and come together to create. And in the process of that, also find the courage to bring out the knowledge and the science and technology so that we get out of the 1800s. I mean, let's face it, you know, almost everything that we're using from electromagnetic waves to car engines to uh, trains to whatever it is are from the 1800s. Maybe jet engines that we use are from the 1930s uh, and rockets from the 1940s. So basically for the last 70 to 100 years, our civilization, notwithstanding all the ballyhoo about um, Silicon Valley, has been arrested in its technological development at a very deep and profound level. And that's a problem because then the consequence of that is that we have half the world's population living in poverty and at the same time we're destroying the biosphere that we all depend on and that our children's children's children's, you know, uh, generations beyond us are going to depend on. So I think, you know, these are the big challenges that, that face us as opposed to endless, you know, fear-mongering and, and sort of ruminations about uh, who we need to be afraid of next. I think, I think really who we need is like, you know, what was that, the man in the mirror, you look in the mirror, who you need to be fr uh, afraid of is right here, it's us. And I think we have to sort of overcome our own fears and, and, and you know, sort of embrace our higher nature and our higher angels, uh, fully aware that we're all fallible and, and none of us are perfect, least of all me. But I think that we have to say, look, we can come together and do better than this. Um, and, and I think that the, 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 the mistake most people make is thinking that somehow this is going to be done by edict uh, out of the White House or the United Nations or some other place, uh, or that it's going to be something that is going to happen uh, from the top down. All big evolutionary leaps in human history have come from the ground up, from us the people, we the people. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Let's go all the way to uh, the U.K. Let's get Johnny Webb, our special correspondent, having his eyes and ears to the ground over there, giving Third Phase of Moon exclusive uh, report from the United Kingdom UFO uh, sightings, uh, stories. Johnny Webb, any questions for Dr. Greer? Welcome to the show. Uh, good evening, Blake, uh, Dr. J, and uh, everyone else. Uh, Dr. Le uh, Dr. Greer, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi there. Um, I'd like to go back on a few points you spoke about in the first hour, um, which was the RTBR3 sightings, which right. was the original um, Belgium disclosure for their military. They, they were one of the first Europeans to disclose their UFO cases. And they used this Belgium 
what I call a TBR free from the typical look of it. We see them over Scotland and Paris. There's a very famous sighting on YouTube in Paris of that. And my question to you is, is were, were you suggesting that these these vehicles, these craft, are not actually alien, but they're owls? Not necessarily owls as in, like, the general public, but as in a secret program? You have to take it on a case-by-case basis. So... so let me tell you how, how this works. If you begin, if an event starts happening that is a certain number of people seeing an extraterrestrial object, let's say when, when General de Brouwer, the Belgian Air Force, told us, and, and actually the Air Force loaned to us some really great night scopes when we went over there during that event to see this going on ourselves, they had uh, NATO radar stations and F-16s that were tracking an object that was going thousands of miles per hour straight up against gravity. But they also had die witnesses from their gendarme of an object that was over a little town that was this massive uh, sort of tre- tetrahedral shape at, at the bottom end of it looked triangular, but very, very low. And it actually did not move off in a linear way. It collapsed into... A, into space into a throbbing orange-red sphere that was trans-dimensional and translucent and then went straight out into space that way. So there are, now, are there a platforms, let's call them, that are man-made electromagnetogravitic, anti-gravity is the pop culture term, but it's really EMG, electromagnetogravitic, systems that could be triangular or dish-shaped, that could fool a casual observer, well, in that sense, yes, of course. Now, what we have found is that often when there's a series of sightings or events that are ET in nature, classified programs will send in a man-made one just to confuse the picture or control the narrative. So it isn't things get piggybacked on top of each other. So everyone wants to say it was either this or it's that, but sometimes it's a mix of both because the obfuscation is the name of the game in the intelligence community. And years ago, there was a national security agency director named General Odom, O-D-O-M, you can Google him, and his right-hand guy was someone I got to know who used to carry his briefcase and was all the meetings. And he's actually the guy who looked at the Marilyn Monroe document I have uh, from uh, the early 60s uh, about Marilyn Monroe, basically. It it was basically her death warrant um, because she was going to disclose stuff that Kennedy had told her about the ET issue, but that's another story. The, the point I'm making is that this gentleman told me that they had something called DDT, and I said, well, yeah, that's this uh, toxic, you know, uh, pesticide, whatever. And he said, no, not that. We call it, <laughs> we set up uh, a decoy, it creates a distraction from the actual events, and then we trash the whole subject through doing that. So they can do that with documents. They can do that with aircraft sighting that are man-made, that can masquerade or hide some ET activity that's going on. They can do this, and it's called a DDT operation. And when you explain this to me, and that it's sort of that sort of a template or a sort of a, uh, a theme that goes through a number of famous UFO cases where it's this, and then it becomes and it morphs to something else. And what happens is that it's not that they're not on top of these things. They certainly know uh, if, if it's beginning to break out into the media. And so there could be a situation where there are genuine ET events happening, and then they'll do something that will make people think, well, this was a man-made event or an experimental aircraft. And people say, well, it wasn't that, it's this, when in reality both things had happened. Now, a great example of that, although it's a more primitive one, was the, the original Roswell thing, where, of course, you know, this event happened, and then they said, well, look, here, we're going to drag out the remains of this weather balloon. Um, the same thing happened when I was in Phoenix in 1997 during the Phoenix Lights events, one of the biggest mass witness events. That, by the way, was the CE-5. I had some people there, and we were doing a CE-5 vector, and I was asking the ETs to do something that would be so amazing that it would make its way into the news, and we could get footage because I was doing a closed briefing for a whole bunch of members of Congress a couple weeks later in April, early April. So what happened, (laughs) this story kind of made strange credulity for people to hear it, but once that was happening, of course, it was seen in a huge area by thousands of people. Even Governor uh, Fight Simonson has eventually come clean that he ridiculed it when he had actually seen it and knew that it was amazing. 
But after that, they sent up aircraft. They dropped a whole bunch of flares. They had them floating down. There are kind of flares that will do this, and you can put them out in a pattern. And they said, well, that's what people were seeing. We were just doing that a little earlier. So this kind of a, a program that's designed to confuse the public is done uh, with great regularity. And I think that's why uh, you know, people get into these slugfests that, oh, it was this, no, it was that, and often it was both. And I think, you know, there, there has to be sort of a deepening of awareness of, of um, how often that has happened in cases that are getting out of the control. Uh, as, as one guy who, who was tied into these um, uh, majestic programs said to me back in the early 90s, he said, he said, look, it's hidden in plain sight. But as soon as it starts coming out like that, we, you know, we just have to do a lot of stuff to divert people's attention, and they employ this DDT uh, strategy. And I liken this to, you know, there, there's these gold nuggets of actual amazing transdimensional ET events, yeah. and then they'll come in, these, these intelligence operatives, and they'll dump a mountain of fool's gold on top of it. And unfortunately, people aren't doing enough of an assay. They're not testing, is this gold or is it fool's gold? Is it real or is it Memorex? as the old commercial used to say. So I think that that's uh, one of the pro tasks that we have to, to, to undertake when, when all these things begin to happen is, is to understand that there's a multiplicity of phenomenon uh, that usually get called one thing. And we have to begin to realize that it's a little more um, involved in that, particularly since you're dealing with a, something where this is the biggest secret in the history of modern society. I mean, if you take the the uh, Wilbur Smith document, that's been an authenticated top secret document from Canada from uh, 1951, where it states that we were studying the modus operandi of these uh, things that were retrieved, and that this is the biggest secret in the history of the United States, transcending the secrecy of the development of the hydrogen bomb. I'm almost quoting from this document. Now, people, when they read that, they have to think for a minute. This was a year before we detonated the first hydrogen bomb. So for the, for the efforts attached to the subject to be more secret than the ultimate doomsday weapon, and we're talking now UFOs, that is an astonishing statement. But you have to then connect that to the fact that they were studying the modus operandi, the mechanism of action of these uh, vehicles, and that uh, a senior scientist at the Naval Research Labs that I've known for many years in Washington, it's the largest defense lab in the United States, um, told me that he was in, in, quote, the vault, and it is what it's called, and saw a document that in October 1954, before I was born, they had mastered what's called gravity control. So from 1954 up to, you know, the early 60s, they began to develop various types of these aircraft. Now, some people have felt that uh, Werner von Braun, Hermann Oberth, and others had knowledge of some of the, the things that uh, Adolf Hitler was working on all the way back to World War II and the Nazi era, that his secret weapon was actually these high-voltage electromagnetic anti-gravity platforms, whereas our secret weapon was the atomic bomb. And I, don't, I would not disagree with that. I think there, there's some good evidence that, in fact, going back to the 40s, there were experiments done uh, with this, but that it really would, had not gotten perfected by the end of World War II, but that a lot of that information began to then be complemented by the studying of uh, extraterrestrial vehicles that we had downed using electromagnetic scalar weapons back in the late 40s up to the current era, and that that potentiated the research and development greatly between 1947 and 1954. So that by you know the mid 50s onward, there were a number of things that were uh, seen and have been seen that are actually man-made, which the layperson could easily confuse to be uh, an extraterrestrial vehicle. And this is why the whole history and, and the study of this uh, it, it is really necessary uh, to be able to make any kind of decision on any given case that gets reported. And a lot of times, as I said earlier. A case will be reported. There's just simply not enough information and data from people who were there to know uh, whether it was, you know, ours, uh, another civilization's, or what. 
You know, Dr. Greer, uh, a while back, a few years ago, I was discussing with a friend uh, why they're hiding this knowledge from us of these extraterrestrials. And he told me that it's not necessarily about uh, we're afraid of them or we can't handle the truth, but more so because of the technology. And you proved that in, in the movie Sirius. And 